if you look at some of the best players in the game, and, and Rory is now 31 years of age, but also prodigies, so much so that they were number one, not only as amateurs, but ascended to world number one, and it didn't take them all that long to do it. Weeks as world number one, when you look at the amateur ranking and the official world golf rankings, McElroy, Spieth, and Rahm. And here's what John Rahm had to say. And he showed clearly that his skills extend beyond just hitting exemplary golf shots. There was the time I heard an interview uh, with my, my golf coach back in Spain when I was younger, Eduardo, Eduardo Celles. Uh, he was saying how we're coming back from practicing somewhere, playing somewhere, and he asked me about my ambitions. I had just started with them, and I think I believe I was 13, 14, uh, around that age, and and I said straight up, I want to be the best player in the world. Uh, I made that deal with myself very young. I believe at 13 or 14, I started working towards that goal, and everything I've done golf-wise has been to become number one in the world and become the best player I can be. And it's pretty surreal to think it's happened this quickly, right? In less than 10 years. I mean, how many people get to achieve a lifelong dream, a short lifelong dream in in their mid-20s? Uh, it's it's incredible to be a Spaniard, the second Spaniard to ever do it. Uh, I'm getting there's not that many Europeans that have gotten to that spot. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty unique feeling, so uh, I'm going to enjoy it for a while. And this from Henrik Stenson. Henrik Stenson signing the shirt of a young boy who's now number one. Henrik doesn't look that much different. John Rahm has grown up a little bit. And as Henrik posted on social media, impressive play. Can, I, can you sign my shirt next week? <laughs> yes, how the tables have turned. Uh, yes. Look, this, is, this, was, this was pretty quick. Yeah. What impresses you most about how he got here? Well, I, just remarkable consistency. And, and, you know, going back to the U.S. Open last year, he started a run. I mean, it was 23 events since then. If you look at how consistent was he, well, he had 15 top tens. Mm. Okay, 11 of those top tens were top threes. Throw in uh, four wins now. There's your ascension to number one. Remarkable consistency. But when you look at John Rahm's game, there is no weakness to it other than at times he can run a little hot. And we saw that. On Sunday, it started to get there, and he righted the ship at the right time and, and ultimately settled down. That has been the knock on him. I think that was a kind of a seminal moment for the new number one that potentially he has stain powder to be there because, look, he drives the ball beautifully. He right. got, he's got a beautiful left to right, a la Nicholas, high ball flight. His ball flight is straight up in the air with all clothes, long irons included. So it's appropriate that he won the Nicholas, you know, Jack Nicholas's tournament. He has kind of a Jack Nicholas type iron game and very similar uh, to that. And then you throw in the fact that his short game's a little bit like Seve, mm -hmm. a little bit. I mean, no one short game is Seve, but he's got a fantastic game around the green. So really, no weaknesses for John Rahm other than John Rahm. And that seems to now be a shadow of the past. In the FedEx Cup standings, with just a few events left in the regular season, Justin Thomas, Webb Simpson are one, two. They both have multiple wins this season. Bryson DeChambeau at four, Rory at five. You can see John Rahm now at eighth. Lanto Griffin, one of the stealth stories of this year, still in the top 10. Of course, he won that Houston Open uh, last fall. Joining us now to get some perspective on another player ascending to world number one is Jaime Diaz. Jaime, what do you think is most distinguishable about how Rahm made his way to number one? Well, there's been a great stability to his journey, and I think it gave him a sort of a sense of inevit inevitability by some people who are watching. Close observers like Johnny Miller said, you know, he looks like he has number one stamped on his forehead. He just made a lot of choices, I think, in shaping his career that are about, about balance and him well. You know, when he left Spain from a very solid family, he went to Arizona State with the intention of staying four years and getting his degree. He did that. You know, as he concentrated on learning English at a high level, it's helped him, I think, navigate his his career very well because he's extremely articulate. Uh, he kept his connection to Spain in terms of uh, his teacher, Eduardo Sayas, and also a sports psychologist he's used forever from there, also Basque, Jose Bilal Carbon. So he married a woman who is a, is a former athlete, understands the challenges that you know he faces now as a, as a very successful professional athlete. He, he's, he plays in Europe all the time. His game travels well because he's very well balanced. He's won six times over there. Just so many things. It's just the depth and maturity to what he's done. 
And even though sometimes he can look immature because he loses his temper, really, I think he's quite precocious and very self-aware. And that shows in, in him being, you know, the third fastest to number one in history. We may be in a hot potato period for number one uh, with all these players who are close. Who do you think will accrue the most weeks at number one if I give you a three-year window? I'm going to go with John Rahm because I really think his rise has been steady and really found based on a really strong foundation. He has not won a tremendous amount. He's won six times in Europe, four times in the United States. But what he's really done is finished high a great many times. You know, a lot of top fives, always in the top 25, just always at points. And I think that's really a great way to stay up at the top of the world rankings. When he starts to put wins together more often, and especially big tournaments like majors, the points are going to really go fast, and he's going to, I think, stretch out a little bit, possibly. I think that's why the Muirfield Village victory was so important, because it was basically major championship conditions, and he proved to himself that he can handle those. So now when he comes into majors where he's had, you know, uh, three top fours, he can he knows he can win them. And I think that's really what's given him uh, something that he can build on. And also, his game is just so well-rounded. He's got that body that he can handle speed with a lot of, uh, you know, stability, again, without... Uh, without straining, and also great short game, great hands. That gives him an advantage, I think, over the other power players like Brooks and DJ and Rory and Bryson. You know, it's interesting, Jaime. He's got 50 events in his world ranking window. Rory's got 49. 28 to 29 top tens. Rory with one more. They have the same number of top fives, 19 during mm. this same period. And Rom with uh, 12 to 10 in the top three category. Very, very close. Thank you, as always. Thanks, Gary.